human beings tend to hold themselves away from abundance because we run on fear and judgment. So the more we detune fear and judgment in our lives and really detune it, fear, detuning the fear and judgment of everything systematically and make that our practice, then life gets to be a whole lot more fun. All right, guys, what is up? Welcome to episode 104. Before we jump in there, let me just say, as far as the mission here at men to mastery, if you ever see the, the, the quotes I put out, I've got those with a tagline on there of purpose, passion, action. And just want to remind you of those things, probably important now more than ever to really check in and make sure you are aligned to your purpose. Explore and feel into what that is if you don't already have a, a feeling for it or what it is right now at this point in your life and, and make sure you've got a passion for what you're spending time on. Otherwise, what is the point, right? And absolutely everything requires action. Make sure you're getting after it, keep it consistent. The other, the other reason I wanted to remind you on this as we segue into what today's episode is about with David Strickle, and this one's called Trust Your Abundance. I heard something really that I've been sitting with recently, science or research or whatever it is, shows that the vast majority of what we do, uh, this operating system that we run on is happening in our subconscious mind. So think about that for a second, right? If, if the vast majority of the way we operate is in this subconscious, where did that come from? It, it was programmed in just like just like a computer operating system, programmed in not even by you and probably very early in life, um, continually throughout. We get hit with marketing and now we have social media and all this stuff. But we talk about those formative years. So you're running, you're not even running yourself. Like 95%, 99%, whatever it is of what is running you isn't coming from you. It came from somewhere else, someone else. So I think it's just, it's interesting as we explore deeper into behaviors and reactions and emotions and attention and intention, where, where do these things come from and begin to question them and explore whether they question whether they really align back to that purpose, that passion, and the way you want to act and take action in the world. So that said, episode 104, David Strickle, Trust Your abundant, Abundance. Excuse me. It's been a little while since I published another one of these episodes. However, I keep recording them. I recorded with David quite some time ago, and if I'm honest, it, it didn't. It just didn't uh, make that much sense to me. It made sense conceptually, it made sense intellectually, it made sense, but in you know my heart, my gut, nothing, nothing resonated with me. David's awesome. What he's doing is is incredible, but it didn't really feel like it had that much meaning to me. That's that's about me, and uh, abundance, right? everything sort of happens when it need when it needs to. So since I recorded this episode and very, very recently, actually, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the things that has happened, uh, the Celestine prophecy, if you ever read that book, prophecy, prophecies, whatever it is. Uh, I read that when I was probably 25 years old. And again, it was, it was something similar to what I just said. It, it made some sense intellectually, but it wasn't necessarily something that was resonating with me that, that I understood from experience at the time. And I just started listening to the audiobook, reading it again. Right. And now at this point in life, it's making a ton of sense to me. I can, I can really relate to it. And, and in the book, as they're going through the story, the, the, the fictional story, trying to explain some realities of the, of the universe, the, uh, the main character asks at one point, it's, it's about these nine insights, right? And he asks somebody, Hey, can you just tell me or give me the other insights? And they said, no, it doesn't work that way. You have to encounter them yourself in your life over time along the path, sort of when the time is right. So I bring this up for two reasons. One, one of those insights talks about coincidence. It talks about serendipity. Um, really are no coincidences, right? Again, things are happening as they need to happen. And between the time when I recorded with David and now publishing it, I said several things started to happen. Well, started rereading or listening to Celestine Prophecy again, recorded another podcast. It'll be out shortly with a gentleman, Dan Mangana, who I then went and did some work with, 
who is also around uh, abundance, welcoming and uh, and capturing abundance in our lives. And then just a week or so ago, my wife and son and I started a 21 day meditation, daily meditation that, that my wife has been sending to my son and to me. Uh, it's from Deepak Chopra. And lo and behold, what is it about? It is really also about embracing uh, abundance and welcoming it into our lives. So with that recent experience, uh, very recent, but also since I recorded with with David, a lot of this has become very clear, very present for me, something I've started to practice, something I've been sharing with others. And so now as I went back to listen to the episode with David to get it ready to publish for you guys, it uh, it really does resonate. It makes a ton of sense now. It is just like those nine insights. You have to hit it when you're ready to hit it and you have to experience it yourself. So with that, uh, I just ask you to get into this episode and this topic today. If it's something that does already feel like it fits for you in purpose and passion or resonates or or really triggers something positive for you, great. Uh, it's the right time. But if it doesn't, if it just kind of just kind of lands, then you know, hang on to it, file it away. Maybe go back and listen to it again in three months, six months, 12 months, and see if it feels any different. Again, this isn't any comment on on David. Uh, he shared some great stuff that you'll hear in just a moment. Uh, it's more about just that connection between the message and the messenger and the recipient at the right place and the right time. So with that, just explore this one with a, an open mind, an open heart, an open spirit. And I hope you enjoy episode 104, Trust Your Abundance with David Strickle. Okay, we are recording. So David Strickle, welcome, sir. You are the founder of the Stream of David podcast, and you also have the Taya practice. Uh, we'll get into what all that is. I just want to say welcome and thank you for being here. I'm excited to explore this with you. Cool. Thanks for having me, Michael. You bet. So um, I'll, I'll let you do a better job of, of a bit of your background and your journey here. But when we got introduced, the the reason I was really excited about about talking is you're a person who in my description, you are really tapped into, um, I'll, I'll call it spirituality, levels of performance as people. Uh, we talked about sort of your, your three tenets, joy, clarity, and abundance, right? Maybe that's a great way to package it up. But these things that sort of seem ethereal, maybe to people who have been very type A, goal-driven, um, the great thing about you that I was happy to find out is you also have sort of the Fortune 500 corporate background, the traditional Western career track, and you've figured out how all this works together to optimize and find those things like joy, happiness, fulfillment. So that's the reason I'm really excited to, uh, to talk to you and learn from you today. So maybe with that, I'll give you a chance to introduce a little bit more of your background and, and your journey and how you came to do what you're doing now. Sure, sure. Uh, I'll go way back and, and kind of uh, give you the, the really quick version of my childhood. I had very disconnected parents. My father left when I was six. My mother uh, sort of gave up on being a parent after my father left. Uh, and so I was really left to my own devices. And I had an older brother. And the two of us, we more or less raised ourselves. And the, the gift in all of that was that I, I had to listen to my inner voice the, the inner voice that I believe we're all equipped with, I had to listen to that inner voice for survival. And it became very well developed to the point where I remember in 1982, a uh, long time ago when I was 14 years old, describing to my older brother in detail, law of attraction. I didn't know what it was called, but I thought it was this cool thing that I invented. <laughs> that I realized that if I believed something, it came true. And I, I, it was this cool thing that I thought I created that I was telling him about, and he thought I was nuts. And I went on into my teen years to manifest the, the, the trappings of a, of a wealthy teenager, even though I was not. I was growing up in a single parent minimum wage household. I think my mother, I remember my mother saying something to the effect of our household income for the year was like $8,000 one year in the 80s. Uh, so that was the type of income that I was raised in. But I had all the nice stuff that all the rich kids in town had, including a nice car when I was a teenager. So I, I learned how to manifest very early on. 
I uh, was not a good student. I really didn't get past the 10th grade in school. I was dyslexic, undiagnosed, uh, and off in my head all the time. And I managed to charm my way through school uh, until about the 10th grade when everyone else was graduating and I wasn't. Uh, I decided to get a GED, which I did, and I started a real estate development. And in 19, 20, 21, I was a real estate developer with no money uh, and, and learned a lot in that process. And from there, got into the corporate world and worked my way up in the corporate world uh, to the point of, of being a manage, managing director slash VP, uh, reporting directly to the CEO of our company. I worked in the same company collectively for 20 years uh, and was very successful at that. And then I got into my early 40s and realized that I had manifested really everything that I thought I, I needed to be happy, my version of a happy adult materially. Big house, nice cars, beautiful things, great travel, fancy restaurants, you know, nice clothes, all that stuff. And I still wasn't really happy. In fact, I wasn't happy at all. And I had seen psychics over the years to try to figure out why, why do I feel different? Why do I think I'm different than everybody else? I was told in my 30s that I was a channel. Uh, that freaked me out. I didn't want any part of that. I didn't want to be one of those weird spiritual people. <laughs> so I kept that part of me hidden for many, many years until I got into my 40s. I started meditating um, when I realized I was not happy, even though I had all the stuff. I thought, okay, there's got to be something more than just all the stuff. I started a meditation practice. And when I did that in 2010, I had a, a kundalini awakening. That's the common term for it, where this mass of energy erupted from the base of my spine and more or less electrified me. And I'm electrified. I don't know how else to describe this to this day. Um, very much uh, third eye. I understand very much uh, the, that energy field and how that the feeling of that being activated um, and, and activating this kundalini energy and, and really savoring it and going really, really deep inward, I came to understand beyond just law of attraction. I became much more of a spiritual practitioner. And I didn't follow a lot of other teachers. I was really following my own inner guidance. And the interesting thing is, over an eight to 10 year period, I created this, for lack of a better term, really, I created an operating system for my life. And that operating system solved my problems all the way to the point where I didn't, I didn't even feel the need to solve problems anymore. I, I conquered all the things that we were supposed to conquer as human beings. I got out of a bad relationship and into an amazing relationship. Uh, I got into the best shape of my life at one point. Uh, I healed myself of chronic pain. I got off of painkillers. I got out of the corporate job and started my own business. I did all of those things. And then once I did all of those things, I realized that, it, that I checked off a bunch of type A boxes really with all that, and then came full circle to this not needing anything, not needing anything to change, not needing that, that outward version of perfection, not needing uh, to, to achieve anything anymore as a type A personality, to just radical appreciation of all that is, including every aspect of me, even the imperfect aspects. So that's where I, I came to this, this place of joy and the detuning of judgment of myself and of all humanity. And when I did that, I realized that I had something to share with the world. And I left the corporate job. I started a, a business uh, around the, the, the podcast that I had. Uh, I'd already started the podcast, The Stream of David, while I was still employed. But I just decided to jump out of the airplane without a parachute and figure it out on my way down. And, I, and it worked. I did. And that's where we started an online course that became uh, the Taya practice, which is what I teach all over the world today. Uh, Taya stands for Trust Your Abundance. And it really is all about absolutely claiming your power to create your life experience the way that you want it. But the big takeaway from it is we are able to detune all judgment and fear. That doesn't mean eradicate, but detune judgment and fear to the point where we are experiencing amazing levels of joy in our everyday lives, regardless of what conditions we're manifesting. 
And when we stop needing to manifest certain things to be happy, then all of a sudden a lot more things start just showing up because we're not in the vibration of need, which is always answered by yes from the universe. When we need something, the universe is going to answer yes, you need it. And you're going to stay in a perpetual condition of needing it. That's why the, the big stuff that we all want to manifest or think we want to manifest eludes us. Because if we think we need money to be happy, we're going to continue to need money to be happy or, or our own business or the perfect body or the perfect relationship or children or any of those things. It's all available to us, but the vibration of need actually chases it away. What, what would be the improved vibration? What's, what's beyond need? What's the description? I would call it, I, I, my favorite uh, topic these days is, is, I call it RA, radical appreciation. Because the idea of appreciating all it is, is radical. And it's not radical acceptance. Radical acceptance is a common um, psychology term. Radical acceptance is, I'm accepting that this happened and I'm going to figure out, it's kind of like forgiveness. I'm going to let you off the hook for doing something bad to me and I'm going to choose to move on from it, which is better than bitterness, certainly. But appreciation is, you didn't do anything to me at all. We co-created something together that wasn't of my liking. But when I detune the judgment of it, I see how I created that for myself. And what were the gifts in that? Where was the, the, the benefit for my own expansion in that? My becoming a more sophisticated consciousness. That's why we're here, to become a more sophisticated consciousness and experiencing the very imperfect earth environment. And when you get to that level of appreciation, Life is so different. You don't care about politics anymore. You don't care about COVID anymore. You don't care about, um, you know, in, in, in caring about it. You're, you're, they're not, those things aren't impacting you in any other way other than just what you allow them to. And nothing gets you down because you can be in radical appreciation of all that is, even if it's your own decline or imminent departure from, from the physical body because we're all going to do that anyway. So when you're no longer fearing death and you're not fearing illness and you're not fearing disappointment, you're not fearing the loss of something because everything's just an experience that we're all ultimately going to lose anyway. Life is very, very different. It's, it's such a heightened level of joy and appreciation and it brings so much clarity and ultimately it brings abundance too because you're no longer in that vibration of need, it, it, it eradicates that, that, uh, that, it does eradicate that vibration of need to be joyous. You can get to a place where you just don't have that anymore. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm following you. I so many questions coming out of this. I, I did want to ask you, and I still do, how, so you described leaving the corporate world and, and the path and finding this extreme abundance and joy and appreciation and gratitude. And I wanted to ask if, if our traditional Western corporate career path, is it compatible? Or you know, do you see people migrating away from that as they sort of evolve? Um, and but although, as, as you were describing radical appreciation, it made me think of Viktor Frankl's man's search for meaning and the mindset that he survived with and then has brought as a gift to the world. The, the answer to the first question is, is we create our own bubbles of reality and everything holds the power that we give to it. So if you're in a, a corporate situation and you are there because it's your preference and you appreciate it and you, and you enjoy it, then there's, there's no judgment, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're in a situation because you're fearing leaving it, and that was the last frontier for me. I, I conquered all of these things. And again, I checked off all my type A check boxes of the things I wanted to quote unquote fix. My corporate job, I had, I had climbed this ladder that I wasn't supposed to be able to climb without a formal education. And I was successful in what I was doing, but I wasn't happy doing what I was doing. And I realized that I was being sort of a hypocrite. I, I was, and I wasn't out, um, sharing beyond just the podcast at this point, but I'm on the podcast talking about uh, abundance and having and being and doing anything that you want. And I was tying myself to this job because of a, a, a really high biweekly paycheck that I thought I had to have. And when I sort of woke up from that and realized, well, this is my final frontier of releasing all of these things I'm, I'm supposed to have uh, in my life to, to check off all these boxes, then 
it just became very, very clear that I just needed to leave the job. And there was, I spent a couple of years trying to find a different version of that job because you get into a field and, and you're known as you know, one of the top people in your field. And you think that that's got to be the path and none of it worked out. I would, I would get recruited. I would be flown around to interviews and, and sort of wine to dine. And then for one reason or another, none of those other opportunities ever really came to be. And that's when I got great clarity on the fact that I'm trying to hammer away at something instead of just being in an allowing state on this topic. I'm allowing in all these other areas of my life, but I wasn't allowing there. And when I quit the job, then everything started unfolding, but it didn't unfold just in this, this smooth trajectory of perfection. I went through all of my money. Uh, I, one of my four favorite stories to tell is, uh, you know, a year and a half to two years into the business, uh, the, the business really un, un, unraveled. And I had a lot of people following, but I wasn't, it, it wasn't generating money. And I tell the story about going to Ralph's supermarket. You're probably familiar with Ralph's in a $90,000 Audi wearing a Rolex watch. And I couldn't, I had the dollars in my pocket were all I had to buy food because my bank account was overdrawn and I'd gone through all of my money. So I looked like this guy with all this money walking in and I'm sitting here, okay, can I afford tuna and bacon? Or, you know, I was on keto at the time. And what can I afford to buy? And I, I really enjoyed that experience. It was kind of cool. It showed me a different side of life because I had always had money as an adult. From the time I was a teenager up until that point, I had always had enough money to go to the supermarket. I never used a coupon in my life. I always just went and bought whatever I wanted. And if it's two, three, four hundred dollars at checkout, it is what it is. I'd always been like that. And then here I am teaching law of attraction, essentially, walking into the supermarket with no money, but I've always been very upfront. I go on my podcast whenever I experience anything in my life. I always go on my podcast and talk about it because I love this stuff. I love the spin outs and the imperfection. I, the last thing I ever want to do is, is try to present myself as some model of perfection because I have the clarity that we're not here for that. We're here for the screw ups and the spin outs and the problems and the obstacles. And the type A part of me wants to solve those things but I have really taught myself to, to flow in the experience of them and appreciate them. And in, in your meeting them in joy, they solve themselves. That situation solved itself very quickly. As soon as I started laughing that I was held at the ridiculousness of doing that and, and really appreciated and enjoyed the experience, that problem solved itself as all problems do. Because it's, we, we are in an abundant universe. If you look at vegetation, look at nature, you realize how abundant our environment is. Human beings tend to hold themselves away from abundance because we run on fear and judgment. So the more we detune fear and judgment in our lives and really detune it, fear, detuning the fear and judgment of everything systematically and make that our practice, then life gets to be a whole lot more fun. And that's what Taya is. Trust your abundance is detuning fear and judgment so that you can trust the universe to deliver what it's wanting to deliver to us anyway, which is an abundant life experience, not a perfect one, but an abundant life experience full of joys, even the joys of, of shopping for tuna because you don't have enough money in your wallet. And I know if you're hearing this and you're not too deep into this, this type of thinking, that sounds crazy. Well, of course I don't want that. I want money. You know, people generally will say, if they had to pick happiness or, or wealth, they would pick wealth over happiness. But if the, if the wealth isn't making you happy, then what's the point of it? Right. Yeah, it, and it, it does seem like so many people, particularly as they reach a level of success, that there's just a, a rather than a growing confidence and comfort, there's there's a growing fear of, of a what if or an unknown, or maybe it's fear of more success, maybe it's imposter syndrome. I don't know, but I, I, I do. I mean, you know that I, I love to ask how and dive into, into understanding a process and, and really even like abundance of obstacles, because those obstacles are the richness to the learning experience and to the growth. And of course, as you mentioned, the appreciation, but it, like if, I, if, I, if I start to dive into how some of this unfolded for you, when you said you started going on those interviews, and then it became clear that this wasn't the right path for you. 
or even just I love the 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 Ralph supermarket story even just the the awareness or the perspective to sort of witness witness yourself walking in there and getting out of the Audi and wearing the Rolex and you're not sure if you can buy the tuna and the and the bacon but having a little bit of um, sort of separation from your reality to observe that about yourself. Maybe even sounds like you almost had a chuckle at yourself in the situation. How, how do you get to that clarity? How do you get to that awareness of, of, um, of your perspective? I think it, it's all of it takes a lot of it, it's a, for me, it was a practice that I developed of going inward and going inward and going inward and appreciating uh, really childhood stuff starting out with appreciating my parents, making peace with, we, we tell these stories, oh, it was so traumatic. My father left when I was six. He went on and had another family. He never loved me, all of that stuff. Uh, I think my father loved me in his own way, but was I his favorite child? Absolutely not, not by a long shot. I was uh, a, a great disappointment to him in, in many, many ways. And I, so I was a transgressor for him and then realizing that, gosh, I, I, I was a disappointment for him and therefore I was a transgressor for him. He was a transgressor for me because he was my father and, I, and society tells me that he owed me something. But really, if you think about it, our parents owe us entry to, to life, if that, if we even get that. And if you stop expecting anything beyond that and understanding that they are imperfect beings just like anyone else and whatever the experience is that you manifest is just that it's just an experience that's the detuning of judgment around that so detuning your father detuning your mother detuning the things that you were taught that that don't work for you learning to detune that early stuff because i i refer to taya as an operating system that i created for myself well, we all have an operating system. It's, it's our subconscious mind, our belief system. And think about it. We manifest into, uh, into polarity. We are all aware of polarity because we're all aware that our, our emotions are a reflection of our vibration. Even if you don't call it vibration, we're all aware of our emotions. And we're all aware that they go through this range. Sometimes we're up and we're hopeful and we're, we're forward thinking, and sometimes we're hopeless. We're exactly opposite of that. So we have this thing called that I call vibrational flow, that there is this, this energy that we're all existing in that has an ebb and flow to it. That's what astrology is based on. I don't get too deep into astrology, but we can see patterns of energy flow in our lives. And we can definitely sense it from a day-to-day -day basis waking up one morning and you just feel fantastic for no particular reason. And the very next morning you may wake up and feel exactly the opposite of that for no particular reason. That's this ebb and flow of vibration. Well, the magic of that is that ebb and flow of vibration exists to create a range of experiences for us because we're manifesting everything. It's always interesting when people talk about learning to manifest, we don't have to learn to manifest. We are manifesting everything that we're experiencing prior to birth from conception, really. So we're manifesting these experiences and we are born into a set of circumstances and we begin soaking up our environment, learning how to be a new human being. And when you are soaking in this environment, your, your parents are your original teachers, uh, the other people that are around you, siblings, uh, culture, religion, uh, financial conditions, all of these things we're soaking all of this in and we're learning to operate in the, in the earth environment and we are discerning a preference right away. And we even start doing that prior to birth. You hear uh, uh, expectant mothers speak of, they eat something spicy, the, the child reacts, right? So we're discerning a preference and we're reacting right from the beginning. And we're creating our belief systems from birth. And these belief systems are our, our operating system. So when something traumatic happens or bad happens or unwanted even, that creates these blocks, these abundance blocks that we have. So if, you're, if you were raised in a scenario where money is an issue and you're taught that money is hard to come by and you've got to work really hard and you've got to do things that you hate doing and you're never going to have anything because of the status that you're born into and you absorb that and you believe it, you are going to continue to manifest that. If you believe you're not good enough, because you weren't the favorite child. If you believe that, uh, 
you know, that, that food is, is, is going to be something that soothes you uh, because you're get, given food as a reward or get, you're going to manifest a belief system and you're going to see that play out in your life all the way through life until you learn that you have the power to change your operating system. So we talk about our bodies being, we're almost like computers if you think about it. I, I think in the creation of, of technology, we are sort of chasing the original technology, which is our own creation. And our computers have operating systems. So the hardware may stay the same, but the operating system gets downloaded and it really operates the, the machinery, right? We're the same way. So we have the power to change our human operating system but it's not something that you just do in an instant. You don't read a book and become inspired and decide you're going to change your operating system. It's a very well-developed vibration, especially by the time we're an adult. So you are always getting sort of drawn back into the old vibration. No matter what you do, you, go, you slip right back into an old habit. We all do that. So the upgrading of your operating system is something that you have to intentionally work on over time. And I see people now that I work with that start significantly changing their lives in weeks from something that they have believed for years, their entire life in a lot of, in a lot of cases. So you can upgrade your human operating system and you can update it, but it's daily focus and daily re, reshaping how you react to things and how you think about things and understanding the power of intention. You, you're, you're creating every segment of your day and every segment of your life via your intention. And when you learn to be habitually intentional, then all of a sudden everything changes. I learned, uh, I used to live in San Francisco and I lived right downtown in, in a high rise, which sounds great until you have to drive to work every day out of downtown San Francisco from a high rise right into to, you know, bumper to bumper stop traffic. And you're looking at an hour plus every direction. I learned to make peace with the commute and the drive and to set an intention. And to this day, I do not get in my car without setting an intention for a safe and stress-free commute. It's just habitual for me to do that. And I always have safe and stress-free commutes. And it wasn't always that way. I used to get into road rage with people in my 20s. I, I grew out of that. But I remember my 20s living in Florida. I had situations. I had a knife and a gun pulled on me in traffic. And I was a co-creator of the experience for sure. But I, and I realized, yeah, I, I knew enough about the law of attraction. I realized, wait a minute, I'm making this happen. I'm the one that's bringing this to me. And I need to change that. And I did. And luckily, I never got shot or stabbed, never got into an accident. But I was manifesting in that direction with that behavior, certainly. So to solve all of that, the next frontier for me was to not only not have road rage, which I solved a long time ago, was to genuinely appreciate my commute. And then I would find myself in San Francisco, Bay Area traffic, on a freeway, 7.30, 8 a.m. in the morning, all by myself in the middle of six or seven or even eight lanes wide, look around and there'd be a wall of cars behind me and a wall of cars ahead of me, and I'd be in the middle lane, just cruising along, enjoying the experience and think, how in the world is there no one around me right now? How weird is this? You have the power to change the behavior of people around you with your intention and your own behavior. I don't attract things of that nature anymore. I don't have incidents in traffic. I don't have people cut me off. I don't have, I just don't have it because I'm not looking for it. Right. Right. That makes a lot of sense to me. And I think that, that, starts to help me understand when we talk about vibration, the way you put it in perspective with energy, I, I, in terms of how I can, I can relate a lot more to how we can affect our own energy, generate energy, change our energy, as well as change our intention and yeah. change our uh, appreciation for the experience. I, I do want to come back a little bit to, you mentioned channeling, you mentioned your, um, I think at the time you recognized you were you were getting some information, download inspiration. And, and you, as an adult, you came back to starting to share it through the podcast, even before you started to, to um, maybe connect that side of yourself to your professional side. But I, th I think if, if I'm not mistaken here, you also mentioned, I mean, that, that sounds very powerful and very special, but I, I, th I think you said we all have an ability to tap into a, a similar 
download of uh, information or tune into. Um, I, I guess the way that relates for me is I, I might call it uh, intuition, mm -hmm. which is is something that I've been it's working absolutely on. That. It's uh, absolutely that. Okay. So I, here's a quick conversation I had about intention with a coach or sorry, intuition with a coach of mine a few years ago when I started working on this, I, I started having this realization that at first I said, I, I don't think I have much power of, of uh, intuition. I don't think I have much intuition. And we started to explore, well, is that really the case? Or is it something you're just, you need practice tuning into, listening to, um, making use of trusting in, right? Trusting. And, and, trusting. Trust is key. Yes. Yeah. And as I started to explore, I realized in hindsight, how many decisions I had made overriding that gut feeling, that heart, that intuition to my detriment, right? It turned out to be terrible, terrible decisions in the sense that they just weren't the right fit for me. So it, it sounds like that, that fits for you as well is, is intention or sorry, <laughs> I keep saying intention, intuition, similar to what we're talking about in this tapping into a download uh, is it is it a divine or does it have to be that spiritual? Is it a little different for everyone? Well, it's 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 interesting because the way I describe what's beyond physical is is consciousness, intelligence, hmm. it, it, and, and yes, I do believe in a eternal intelligence, eternal consciousness that is a collective that we're all part of. All creation is part of it. I do believe in that absolutely. I don't think that it's. A judgmental entity. I don't think it's anything that's looking to be worshipped or humanized. It's not human, uh, but I do think we're all expressions of that. And I do think that it, there there is a loving element to that energy, and we're all aware of that. Love is an intangible thing that we're all aware of. Even scientists are aware. You can't prove love, but they know that it exists. That that powerful, positive, expansive, loving energy that is all knowing we all have that available to us because it's already in us. It's not something that's separate from us at all. And I do believe that. That's about as woo-woo as I get. Even though I speak from that perspective, I believe that we do, we're all aware of it. And we have all been taught religious teachings or we've seen sci-fi movies. We have all of these different versions of what that is. And very often it's sort of a humanized version of it. We see angels. Uh, the, the, this helpful, I've definitely experienced a helpful, protective, loving energy in my life. I do not necessarily identify that as an angel, but some people do. And if that brings them peace, then I think that that is their reality. And I think that that's fantastic. I, I, I would love to see all of humanity move toward a place where we're more allowing of individual belief systems instead of dogma. We're taught so much dogma. And think of how ego-based that is. I believe this, and therefore it's the only way, and I'm right, and you're wrong, and you've got to believe. And people kill each other over these things since recorded history, right? And, and how amazing would it be if we all could just be allowing of other people to have their belief systems, and we have our own, and it's all good. It's very kumbaya, I know, but uh, we're capable of doing that. So as far as your intuition goes, I like to teach based on what we call the virtual vibrational spiral. So when you're at the very top of your spiral, you are allowing your natural, what I call source connection, your, your source of eternal wisdom of consciousness of love, however you want to identify that. People do call that God. When you're up there, you are completely allowing of that to, to be who you are. And you know you're up there when you are at peace, when you're in joy, when you're relaxed. Very often we find ourselves in that space accidentally when we're doing what I call low thought activities. If you're out on a long country drive and these great ideas just pop into your mind or in the shower, or if you're just, if you're working out or if you're gardening, or if you're just doing something that you're, you're not trying to clear your mind. Sometimes we really get tripped up in meditation, trying so hard to clear our mind and thoughts come in and then we beat ourselves up about it. But if you're just doing something that takes a little bit of thought, you're driving a car all the time, you're out on a long stretch of road, you're in a, a joyful state, just being, and all of a sudden these amazing ideas pop in, that is your source connection. That is your intuition. And it's available to you all the time, but you're more allowing of it up there because you're not going to look for it and you're not in a fearful state or a, a self-deprecating state or anything less than that that would really separate you from it. Because when you start 
and I'm speaking all of humanity, not you specifically, when you start in on, I'm not worthy, this isn't real, I shouldn't trust that, I got burned before, so I, I have this fear block around something, oh, I, I don't know if I should do that or not, uncertainty, anything less than joy and clarity, you're, you're moving down that spiral. Mm -hmm. And you can move all the way down just for the sake of teaching, we've created this sort of midpoint called neutrality where you're no longer allowing your natural source connection to be part of the decision-making process. That's in, in this, this little line of neutrality. If you think about hope being the first step up and doubt being the first step down, because if you're hopeful, you're expecting something a little better next and you can build momentum from there and go up the spiral. If you're doubtful, then you can build momentum in that direction as well and go down the spiral all the way down into fear and envy and self-loathing and, and all of these things. And we move through this spiral all the time. Certainly some of us are more up while others are more down generally, but very often our, our thought process, our belief systems that we've created for ourselves are exactly what's holding us. I think moving up and down the spiral is natural because of this polarity I was speaking of earlier. This vibrational flow that comes through is sort of taking us up and down. And the purpose of us being taken up and down the spiral is so that we have a mix of experiences. We're not just here to have smooth sailing, perfect lives, even though sometimes it looks like some people are, I don't believe that anybody is. I, I talk about the Instagram version of life and I have, um, I used to work out with this trainer who had this uh, huge Instagram following and the, the look of the feed is, oh my gosh, this person's life is perfect. You know, best time, best travel, best body, best cars, just fun, 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 joy, amazing. Oh my gosh, this person's so amazing. And was really a, a tormented individual. <laughs> when you work out with somebody a few hours every single week, one-on-one, -on -one, you come to understand, you're, it's like therapy for both of you, right? very, very tormented, very unhappy person, but outwardly did not look that way. And I'm not trying to just call them out for that. I think everybody's like that. We, we put out the very best version of us very often, but that's just what we're putting out there. We're not sharing the down the spiral stuff and we all have it. But the good news is, is the down the spiral stuff actually has a purpose. And that purpose is to inspire us toward new creation. It, people say the universe is sending me X, Y, Z to teach me a lesson. Well, you're manifesting that. And if there's a lesson available, then you're solving that, that transgressor. And perhaps you never have to visit it again. And that's amazing. That's expansion. You've expanded your being eternally and figuring that out in physical. That's why we come to physical existence. So the spiral is a really cool thing to learn about and learning what vibrational flow is and really being at peace with it and understanding that obstacles are part of the, the gig here and meeting them in joy is such an amazing way to live life. And it doesn't mean that I'm going to make peace with all my obstacles and have a lot more of them. It does exactly the opposite. You actually have fewer of them. And the cool thing is when you go down your spiral, you create more obstacles. The day does not go well. That's those days that nothing's going right. Uh, and unexpected things pop in. And, and the more you react negatively, the more you're going to receive of that. But polarity will pull you out of that. If you don't try to intentionally move out of it, and you can do that, polarity will pull you back up. Well, when you get above neutral, you are now reemerged in your natural source connection, and you are now capable of new thought. If you start thinking of it in terms of that, when you're above neutral, you are one with source, new thought is available, that's your intuition. When you're down the spiral, you're not capable of new thought. You are in a fear mode, different degrees of fear, but you're in a fear mode and you're recycling. So think about that. When we're down and we're operating in fear, we're recycling the same stuff over and over and over again. All you have to do is take your vibration above neutral, the solution appears. We've all had a situation where something is really frustrating and we just have to step away from it for a moment. And then we distract ourselves and we come back and suddenly it works. It's magical when that happens. We're all capable of that on an all day, every day basis. That's how powerful vibration is. To, you, you mentioned Instagram and you mentioned technology earlier. So just, just two questions on this. So put this in historical context. 
it just feels like we have so many distractions. So at the same time, technology is wonderful and we can connect and you and I can have this conversation and we can share this knowledge and inspiration to the world. It's at the same time, we have so many distractions that we can keep busy with versus kind of that flow state you describe where we, we tap in and find this inspiration, solve problems and answer things for ourselves. We also have, uh, I believe, and arguably so many things about our modern health, lifestyle, diet, things that sort of jam up our, our energy. Is, is, it, is it harder now in this description of modern life than in centuries past where people more tuned into or they more consistently operating at these higher vibrational levels because there weren't uh, so many distractions or is this just everybody's always had their challenges and this is our modern flavor of it? I think both are true because in a in a physical environment, we are experiencing earth, we're in a physical environment, it's always polarized. So there's going to be positive and negative on every single topic. If you if you dig deep enough, you will find positive and negative in everything. It's great to fall in love and have a relationship and be in a committed relationship, and then you fight. Right? Or it's wonderful to have children, but then you have children <laughs> to deal with. Everything seems wonderful and perfect and amazing, but nothing is ever just that. There are negative aspects of everything so that everything is polarized in our environment. And the more you appreciate it, flaws and all, and don't even see them as flaws anymore, see the perfection of all of it, then all of a sudden you're not so polarized in your opinion of it. And you see that across humanity. A lot of people, time is sort of speeding up. Things are moving faster now. I'm 53 years old. So I, I am very aware of what the 70s were like. I'm very aware of the 80s, the 90s. And it was so much simpler when I was a kid. We had three stations to watch on television and no internet. And you went outside and played at night and there was a telephone that we didn't have an answering machine when I was a kid. So it was so simple then, but we didn't see it as that. I remember watching television and seeing the adults on television talk about how complicated things were and the world was going to hell. So I've heard the same stuff throughout my entire lifetime over and over again. I remember the environment was a big deal back then, but it wasn't the environment, it was the ozone layer, which was tied to the environment. And now it's something totally different. It's That it drives fear and behaviors. So moving through just the amount of life that I've moved through, I can say that I have seen how things are much more complex now than they were when I was a kid. But that complexity is a sign of our ever expanding intelligence collectively. We are much more sophisticated now. We are too sophisticated now to go back to the 70s. It would be so cool. I thought the 70s was a cool decade and I was a little kid. I wasn't a teenager till the 80s, but gosh, it just seemed so cool, but it wasn't cool for everyone, certainly. And there are aspects of it that were, were really, you, you were eating a lot of garbage food back then, a lot of pollution in the air. No one was doing anything about those things. It's kind of started around that time. And now we're, we're seeing that, okay, we learned some things in those decades. Now we have all this technology. We can jump on a podcast. I can meet people all over the world on Zoom, which I do all day, every day in my work. And we have all these things, but at the same time, you're right, there's contrast. There's negative aspects of it, but there's no going back. We're becoming more sophisticated beings. Eternal consciousness is becoming more sophisticated. And in that ever-increasing sophistication, we have to get up to speed with it because it's our new reality that we've created for ourselves. So finding appreciation for all of it is actually driving humanity to this, 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 this space that I have been encountering uh, since the onset of COVID at the beginning of 2020 is more and more and more people moving toward some version of awakening, some version, people are, are, are identifying as spiritual now more than ever and sort of moving away from organized religion and, and rule books and things like that into this, this journey. And in, these journeys are all different. It's a big tent spirituality and there's nothing right or wrong in any of that. It's a personal experience. And I see a lot of people moving in that direction. And while I see people moving in that direction, I see others becoming more polarized than ever. Look at politics. Politics is more polarized than ever. There was a time that you could go to a party as an adult and you could actually meet someone that was a Republican and maybe you're a Democrat or the other way around and you could agree or disagree and still be friends. We've moved into this space now 
where you're not even allowed to be friends with someone that doesn't share your belief system. And even COVID is polarized. Whether you wear a mask or not is this political statement. Everything is so polarized, but not everybody is there. Not everybody is in that space. And I believe that sticking yourself in that polarized space of needing to be right, that's all ego-based stuff. And when you're separated from source and you go down the spiral, the ego really takes over. Ego is not a bad thing, but if you are cutting off your source connection, your humanness is an overdrive. And humanness is all about fear and, and repetitive patterns and things like that. So when we're up our spiral, when we're in balance, and the more you work up through your spiral, and the work really is the detuning stuff, it's the unlearning of the things that we pick up in our lifetime. And the more you operate above neutral, the more clear you are, and the more chill you are, you're just okay. I, I, I live in a community that has a very singular focus politically, and people think I have two heads when I say, I'm cool either way. I don't care who wins the election. My life's going to be fine no matter what. And I've proven that to myself in my adult lifetime. Oh my God, how can you think that if it's so-and-so wins, it's going to be the worst, you know, and, and, and they just lose their minds. And I'm like, oh, sorry, that's just not where I am. I'm the creator of my reality. And I, 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 I think I've gotten to that tipping point of age where I've lived enough that I've seen so many patterns come and go and get recycled and it's all the same fear-based crap and we don't have to play in that sandbox if we don't want to. Yeah, it really is the same playbook and I appreciate that perspective. So maybe if we, we try to uh, land this thing on, uh, we, we mentioned being very practical at the beginning. So before we talk about where people can, can find you if they wanna learn more, tune in more and, and work further with you, just in terms of practical advice, and you mentioned daily practice, what, what would be one thing I could take away and start practicing that would help me with gratitude, appreciation, this vibrational level, and just kind of better quality of life? The, the, the one thing that I like to, to leave people with, the most powerful tool that I share, that I, in my opinion, is the thing that holds us away from joy and, 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 and causes us to stumble when we're trying to get a new practice going is that inner voice of limiting beliefs, the inner critic. So a technique that I came up with uh, a few years ago is I always had this, this inner critic, even though I understood law of attraction, I had this inner critic that was very much a product of my parents. I had a mother, I had a father that, that moved out when I was six, I told you, and he started another family and wasn't really involved in my life. And I was definitely disappointed to him. I had a mother who I think would be considered mentally ill and she was really verbally and physically abusive to me. And she used to tell me horrible things about me. You're worthless, you're a piece of crap. I wish you were never born. She even told me to kill myself one time when I was a teenager. Well, having a mother like that, believe it or not, will develop this inner critic in you. So even though I learned as a teenager, I figured out that that was in this inner voice helped me figure that out, that all that was about her and not about me and not to internalize it too much. I still went into my 20s and 30s with this inner critic on certain areas. And it was the thing that told me that I had to be uh, rich. I had to be a high earning person and living in a big fancy house. Um, and then it also would, would really beat me up in certain areas if I wasn't perfect. And this voice, I used to call it the let's beat up on David game. This, this little, little voice would just play on demand all the time. And then I decided, well, maybe it's more than just a voice. Maybe it's actually its own thing. So I created this entity and I named it Claude. And so I took that inner critic voice and I actually made it sort of a thought bubble out beside me. And I named it Claude. And Claude was, had no meaning in my life whatsoever. I didn't know anybody named Claude. I just thought it was kind of a not great sounding name. I now have a friend named Claude. <laughs> He's seen the videos of me talking about it. Sorry, sorry I created that before I ever met you. Uh, so I, I named it Claude and naming it and giving it this external identity. It may sound nuts on the surface, but it was so powerful. Because then I started recognizing it at the onset and I made it something that was no longer me. It was, it was a transgressor for me for a long time. And I realized that when I made and named it and made it something external, I could pay attention to it and I shut it down exactly the same way I would shut a human being down if they were doing that stuff to me. So I, I sort of gave it a personality in its own 
image. And the cool thing is, is that I shut down Claude enough to where Claude didn't come around anymore. And then I realized that Claude was something I could ultimately appreciate that it served a purpose in my life to create a lot of contrasting experiences that gave me all these teachings. So I love Claude now and Claude doesn't chime in on me anymore. So that is a tool that I love to teach people because it's something anybody can do. You can start catching that voice of limiting beliefs that comes in, that voice that says you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't invest in yourself. You shouldn't believe in yourself. You shouldn't quit your corporate job and start your own business or whatever it is that you really want to do when you're up that you start becoming fearful about when you're not so high on the spiral because that is a very dishonest voice. The more you down the spiral, that Claude takes over. So that's what I love to teach people that anybody can apply in their lives right away. And, and it just gets more powerful the more you practice it. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. I feel bad for your friend Claude now. I, I, have, <laughs> I have one friend, French Canadian, so he pronounces it Claude. Um, He's but... French Canadian also. Yeah. <laughs> there you go, right? So yeah. feel bad for all the Claudes out there, but it's a, it's a great tool. Thank you so much for sharing it. And thank you for what you do, David, hosting the Stream of David podcast. I definitely have to tune into that and what you created in the Taya practice. So for folks that, uh, that want to get deeper, I mean, this is pretty deep stuff. And, and I personally want to go a bit further as well. You mentioned a couple of things off air to me. Where can we point people that want to dive in, know you more, contact, reach out, and kind of go sure. further? Yeah. The, the best, uh, the, the group is the Taya Practice Facebook group, if you're on mm -hmm. Facebook. Uh, and I've actually had people create aliases and rejoin Facebook to get into the group. So you could always do that. Uh, Taya is T-Y-A, the Taya Practice. So you can join the Facebook group. And then we also have a masterclass. If you go to the stream of David masterclass.com, long URL, sorry, the stream of David masterclass.com, you can dive right in and start learning this tie practice. So those are two good options. If you really want to, if you're not on Facebook, don't want to be on Facebook, go to the stream of David masterclass.com. If you're on Facebook, join the tie practice Facebook group. Okay, fantastic. And again, Ty is trust your abundance. Uh, I love that. I love that line of thinking. And uh, yeah, thank you. I will get, it's a long URL, but we'll get links out in the show notes for this episode. David, thank you for doing what you're doing and, and bringing it out to the world. And I'll check it out on Facebook, but I, I love that I'm not big on the platform. So I love that you have this masterclass. Uh, that sounds fantastic. Very good. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. No, it's been my pleasure. Thank you for allowing us to learn from you and appreciate your time and uh, keep it up. Great stuff. Thanks, man. David Strickle, thanks so much.